Welcome to a special edition of Justice. I'm Judge Jeanine Pirro. Tonight, an hour-long investigation into the dangers facing the U.S. power grid. What would it take to bring it down? And if our system did break down, how would you survive? And what would it be like in the dark? I'm in Lower Manhattan right now, standing in front of a power station, a typical power station. But last month I went to a meeting just a few blocks from here in the freezing cold. But when I came out of that meeting, I was frozen. Not from bitter temperatures, but from fear. I learned things that no one is talking about. Things that can change my life, your life, and the lives of everyone you know forever. I started thinking about how fragile life is and how ill-prepared we are for this. Tonight, in an exclusive justice investigation, the vulnerability of America's power system, the United States electric grid. Are we ready for a terror attack? And what would we do if the lights went out? Now tonight is about a series of forces and individuals who instead of doing the right thing for you and me, are playing politics and gambling with your safety and our way of life. Now, who of us could ever envision 9-11 happening? But the difference between 9-11 and what I'm about to tell you is that we know that this can happen. The question is not will it happen, but when will it happen? And the consequences would be a million times worse than 9-11. One day, you're enjoying the comforts of life. The next, everything is different civilization as you know it would be gone. An electromagnetic pulse would destroy all electronics and the transformers that power everything, anything, with an on-off switch. Your hot water heater, your refrigerator, your dialysis machine. Hospitals are closed. Grocery shelves are empty. Most of the food you have at home is spoiled. And forget about your bank accounts. It doesn't matter. What you have in your pocket is all you can access. I imagine myself waking up to total darkness, nothing in my home working, food spoiled, water not running. I rummage through whatever last cans of food I can find. I'm alone because my kids and loved ones have no way to get to me. And I'm afraid, afraid to leave because it's too dangerous. People are desperate. They're hungry. Our civilization thrown back to the dark ages. I'm scared and helpless, and I don't know how I can survive. If there were to be such a catastrophic failure, our death toll would be staggering. A blue ribbon commission predicting mass fatalities, horrific loss of life, some even saying nine out of ten Americans would die. This is not science fiction. It's real. And tonight we'll tell you about the ways that it could happen. A solar flare, an electromagnetic pulse, a nuclear device, a cyber attack, or a simple physical assault, all of which would break down our society as we know it. You know, in this complicated world that we live in, many wish us destruction. But it is he who has the capacity, ability, and inclination to act on that ill will against America. It is he against whom we must be ever vigilant. Now, scientists tell us that an EMP created by a nuclear weapon at high altitude is the most efficient way to take out America's electric grid, telecommunication networks, 
and all critical infrastructures. As I stand here now, North Korea has a satellite the size and weight of a small nuclear weapon orbiting at an altitude conducive to an EMP attack and it approaches our country from the south, a direction which lacks early warning or missile defenses. The threat could also be from the sea. Fact, six months ago, two full-up nuclear-capable missiles on their launchers were discovered in Panama on a North Korean flagged vessel hidden under sugar bags. Reports are that our grid has already been penetrated by our enemies, leaving behind software programs that can compromise it. Now, there are other ways to take down our grid. A simple, direct, physical attack, like an assault on a local substation. Fact, 10 months ago, unknown attackers attempted to blow up a San Jose transformer substation in a military-style raid. No one has been apprehended. The FBI and local police call it vandalism, as if Billy Bob and Bubba, after a few beers, a night out, get their hands on AK-47s and surgically knock out 17 transformers, 16 circuit breakers after cutting underground fiber optic cables and outsmarting security cameras and motion sensors. These terrorists are still out there. And less than a week later, in a shockingly similar attack in Tennessee, a suspect on a boat fired shots at a nuclear power plant and then engaged with police. A trespasser, you might say? Someone armed from the water willing to engage in a shootout with law enforcement is certainly not Bubba with a few beers in him. And even if no one attacks our grid, the sun will. The Earth is exposed to intense solar flaring roughly every 150 years. The last time it occurred was 1859. Do the math. We're due. Now, I'm not saying this to panic anyone, but everyone, including our enemies, know that an artificially created electromagnetic pulse will shut down all power, which risks our complete survival. Now, we possess, the United States possesses the world's largest power distribution system. What is our government doing to make sure that our grid, likened by some to that of a third world country grid, is really protected? Are we ready for an attack on our grid and the catastrophic failure that would result? And that's my open. And joining me now is former Navy SEAL Christopher Mark Even. Chris, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Judge. Um, you were a Navy SEAL for more than a decade. Uh, you have experience with the with the grid. What can you tell us about it? You know, the power grid is 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 an amazingly easy to dismantle. As an unconventional warfare specialist, I was trained to dismantle and take down power grids in other countries. Believe me, it doesn't take a doctorate from MIT to figure out how to make an EMP device that will take down not only a substation, which this is right here, but the transmission stations and the distribution stations. With several EMPs placed properly in the right locations, utilizing a cell phone device with an RFD technology, which is remote firing device technology, could bring down 15 transmissions a a cell, with a cell phone. With a cell phone, absolutely. So you, you don't have to be that smart, that sophisticated, or anything to take down power systems? Technically, no. All right, and so what do you do to prevent that kind of thing from happening? Well, we've, we utilize what's called red cell tactics, techniques, and procedures where we go into installations and do what's called a threat and vulnerability assessment after we've attacked the installation to show them where their weaknesses are. I've done that as a SEAL. I've done that as a civilian with my own business. Now, what oftentimes happens, unfortunately, is the powers that be don't take the recommendations that you give them seriously for whatever reason. And what we're seeing now is, you know, we have what's called the uh, Federal Energy, um, the FERC. It's a regulatory commission for energy, and it's made up of guys who are desk jockeys, former FBI agents that have never been downrange. They're not trained in unconventional warfare. 
they took a class for two days or three days, and now they're putting them in charge of this energy uh, uh, commission? That's ridiculous. Well, you know, you say when you do a report assessing the vulnerabilities of these particular substations or transmission centers, I mean, what happens to those reports? They sit on a desk, they get looked at, they get tossed around, they say, wow, these recommendations are too costly, or we, we're just pointing out we're not going to do them because they're going to affect our bottom line. And that's usually what happens. You know, there's cameras if you're everywhere, but a camera without a person behind it is a dead camera. And you can't take someone who worked at Walmart yesterday and looked at a camera and then put them on a, on a commission and say, now they're a security expert. That's just basically what we're seeing when they put an FBI non-field agent in charge of these programs. This, this operation that took place in San Jose was one or two guys probably did it. Right, right. And, of course, that's the one with the AK-47s, and they, they shot for 20 minutes. They took out the whole substation almost. As a SEAL, those were some techniques that I would have utilized in order to make that happen. And what no one's talking about is this affected Silicon Valley directly. And what's in Silicon Valley? Yahoo, Google, Facebook, PayPal, things that every American uses on a daily basis. All right. And so what do you think their goal was? I'm thinking, you know, two things. Everyone says this was a test. It could have been a test, but I'm also thinking maybe there's some, some things that they've already instituted or implemented as a result of that attack. You've been a Navy SEAL. I mean, you've been in harm's way. You know the dangers to, to us and to Americans. Uh, what do you think it's going to take to get people to focus on this? Judge, you know, that's a, a very good question. As Americans, we've traditionally had knee-jerk reactions to everything. I mean, 9-11, we were proactive for a little bit, but now we're taking, you know, we're, we're, we're not taking any proactive approaches. As Americans, we're, we're in trouble right now. There's, I think there's things that are in play right now in our country that we're not aware of. If our power, if our power grids go down, I suggest, you know, everyone stock up on batteries, baby wipes, and biscuits because it's going to be a series of very long, very long nights and months. Right now, we know that there are surface-to-air missiles that were identified in Panama with a North Korean flag on the vessel. They were hidden under sugar bags. I mean, what, tri what does that trigger in your mind? Well, that just tells me that there are many forces that are complicit with attacks on the U.S. from the inside out. I mean, Pakistan has an atomic bomb. China does very much, either just North Korea. It's not hard to fathom that these countries are getting together and plotting and planning, you know, the, the destruction of our country from within. Our borders are very porous right now. That's another point of contention. Those, those, we've got problems, Judge. We really do. All right. Christopher Mark Even, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Judge. All right. My pleasure. And coming up is former CIA Director James Woolsey, as well as the former Secretary of Energy. Stay with us. The power grid is vital to our way of life, and by all accounts, it's woefully unprotected. The threat of a terror attack is one that needs to be taken seriously now. So says my next guest, former United States Ambassador and former Director of the CIA, James Woolsey. Uh, Ambassador, thanks for being with us and the CIA. You know firsthand how many enemies we have out there. What do you think is the biggest threat to our grid? Uh, they could launch a uh, satellite with a simple nuclear weapon in it, uh, they, best if they launch it uh, around the southern pole, uh, because we don't have any defenses and, and very little warning uh, down there. Uh, and uh, while it's in orbit, uh, just uh, detonate it. And this could be a very simple nuclear weapon, similar to what we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It doesn't have to be sophisticated at all. It doesn't need any accuracy. You're not trying to hit anything on the ground. You're just detonating a nuclear weapon up uh, 30 miles or so uh, in space. Uh, that would take out the grid for probably a quarter to a third of the United States. And if you detonated it up at a couple of hundred miles, it would take out the grid for most of the United States. And why don't we have the defenses in the southern part, uh, and I talked about this in the open, in the southern part of our, our nation, so that a satellite could come in and could be detonated. I mean, it doesn't have to even be specific. What, why are there no missile defenses down there? Uh, I guess I would say, if I were being uh, flippant, that uh, uh, we've turned uh, over defending the country's uh, electric grid uh, to people with the uh, f overall focus of ostriches. Uh, <laughs> nobody really wants to do anything on this in the federal government except uh, stick their heads in the sand. Uh and Ambassador, do, do you think that the power plants across the country have the protection that they need? 
No, absolutely not. Uh, nuclear power plants, uh, particularly uh, uh, if hit by an electromagnetic pulse, uh, 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 would uh, melt down uh, before too long, and uh, you'd have uh, disasters emanating from the nuclear power plants as well as from a lot of other sources. If if you take out by taking down the the, the grid, if you take out uh, the electrical system. Everything else goes down too. We have 18 critical infrastructures in the country and 17 of them depend on electricity. So you lose your communication system, you lose transportation, you lose uh, your bank uh, teller uh, system for getting money. Uh, nothing works. And you were the head of the CIA. Our yes. enemies know all this, correct? I'm afraid they do. Uh, the Russians uh, have told us that they, uh, back in the early 90s, uh, told the North Koreans a great deal about how to uh, use an electromagnetic uh, pulse uh, detonation. Um, the Ir Iranians and the uh, North Koreans have both orbited satellites to the south, and the North Koreans have tested several uh, simple uh, nuclear weapons. The uh, Iranians haven't uh, yet, but probably will uh, before too many months go. So um, we have at least two um, very bad states tied very closely to terrorist groups and the rest uh, that could be ideologically crazy enough uh, to uh, try something like this. And, and you know, you don't need to uh, a satellite. Uh, you, uh, you, can, you can lift a nuclear weapon quite easily with a, with a weather balloon up into low Earth orbit and detonate it. That's all that's needed. Ah, not very comforting. All right, Ambassador Wolseley, thanks so much for being with us. Good to be with you. All right, and coming up, the former Secretary of Energy, when the lights actually did go out, Spencer Abraham. And later, I hit the streets of New York with an urban survivalist. We take for granted when we flip a switch, the lights go on. When we turn a key, the car starts. But it seems the United States is not taking steps to reduce our vulnerability. With me, former United States Secretary of Energy, Spencer Abraham. Secretary, you were the Energy Secretary when the lights actually did go out in the Northeast blackout of 2003. What's been done since then to prevent something like that happening on a national scale? Well, you know, there's been a lot of things done, and, and I think uh, what we learned then was that not having reliability standards that were enforceable at the federal level uh, made it possible for people to do things, utilities and others at the local level, that uh, simply didn't meet the right standards. We did pass legislation to create a federal reliability standard in 2005, and I do think that has improved. but. You know, the other thing that needs to happen here, and, and I always stress this, is that the, the public has to appreciate the point you made. For the lights on every time, we need to be more open to having adequate supplies of power and having transmission systems that are modernized and up to date. And all too often, what we find are groups, individuals, whoever, trying to stop any new development in these areas. All right. Well, Secretary, listen to what former Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood said on the show a few weeks ago. We know that uh, all of the transit systems uh, that run uh, around our country today uh, are, are electrified by, by power grids. If the Northeast uh, Quadrant... Uh, 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 were, were shut down, uh, it would cause a calamity. And there's no question that that is the case, but this is the United States of America, uh, uh, Secretary. We've got a Congress, we've got a President, we know we're vulnerable, we're not talking out of school here. What is it going to take to get the government, not that they're starting to work together, but the government to really clamp down on the local electric companies and people who control the grid? Well, first of all, I think there is a lot of oversight. You know, in the wake of 9-11, and I was secretary at that time, uh, we met with uh, Tom Ridge, who became Homeland Security Secretary, and I worked together and met with, on regular occasions, the people that run these systems to try to help them do a better job. A lot of information is shared between the companies and between the government and the companies. I don't think there's been a, a massive failure here. I think there there is always the, the ability to improve things. But I do think we have to have uh, cooperation, uh, not only from the, the local utilities, but from the citizenry itself. And I think 
uh, for people to object to every new power project or transmission system upgrade uh, is a contributing factor. All right, Secretary Abraham, thanks so much for being with us. Judge, good to be with you. All Thank right. you. And coming up, this should be a bipartisan issue. So why are laws designed to protect the grid and Americans being stalled in Congress? An attack on a California power plant last April got almost no press until my next guest brought it to the front pages. Rebecca Smith from the Wall Street Journal joins me now from San Francisco. Rebecca, you were all over this and, you know, it's 10 months later with little or no press other than yours and virtually nothing done in terms of an arrest. Why do you think this went so unreported until now? I think because the people who had knowledge of what happened, for the most part, didn't want us to know. And that is to say the utility that was afraid of copycat attacks and the FBI and other law enforcement that hadn't been able to crack the case. Well, you know, when you say copycat uh, attacks, I mean, isn't it important for the FBI and the local power companies to recognize the vulnerability uh, and then kind of use this as a reason to protect our grid? I mean, it's nice to say we don't want a copycat, but it's not like the rest of the world doesn't know this. Absolutely. In fact, I would say you don't want a copycat, but in fact, the cat is out of the bag. We had the attack. They brought down a major substation that supplies power to Silicon Valley, and there are plenty of other, even more important, critical substations that are equally vulnerable. All right, and you said right off the bat, again, to your credit, Rebecca, that this was not an amateur operation. Why? Um, I think, you know, and you're a former prosecutor, so you, so you know all about sifting through evidence. Since we don't know who did it, there haven't been any arrests, we don't know what the motive was. But there are plenty of pieces of evidence that suggest something was very well planned. For, to begin with, they started by cutting fiber optic cables. Three communications and AT&T. Underground, underground fiber optic Underground cables. in vaults. Very difficult to lift up those lids. They knew just what to cut. They cut it in such a way it was hard to repair. Then they moved to the substation a few minutes later, and they targeted pieces of equipment that could cause great damage without causing a fire or something that would have been an, you know, a, a massive explosion or fire that would have attracted attention. Mm -hmm. As you know, Judge, this substation sits right next to a major freeway. So there are people passing by at all times of night. I don't think they wanted to draw attention. Well, and in addition, they had the AK-47 shooting, almost sharpshooting, military-style raid for almost 20 minutes, and I think they took out how many uh, uh, transformers? They took out 17, and the thing that's important to note, I mean, the utility will say, uh, you know, it's bad, but people didn't lose power. Um, the fact of the matter is these transformers were damaged, but they weren't destroyed. If they had been destroyed, we would, it would have been quite a, quite a different situation. All right, and, and shocking is that the FBI is still calling this vandalism as if uh, it's a bunch of teens. Anyway, Rebecca Smith, we're going to stay on this. Thanks so much for your reporting. And I'm joined now by Maine State Representative Andrea Boland, who fought to have emergency legislation passed in her home state of Maine that would protect the grid from both a natural disaster and electromagnetic pulse. All right, Representative, your state of Maine is considered the most vulnerable of the lower 48. So you sponsor a bill, the first of its kind in the nation. Tell us about the bill and the law. What the bill uh, asked for was to put protections on the um, major transformers and the grid in Maine as a requirement for going forward with any expansions that they want to do and to also put them on the current expansion that is underway. What happened was when these fabulous experts came to Maine, they opened up the understanding of the Utilities Committee so broadly that they understood it was a huge issue and they passed a bill out of the committee unanimously as emergency legislation. There is an estimate that would, it would cost um, homeowners two dollars each to upgrade the grid or to provide the security that you would need in the state of Maine, is that correct? Uh, th that's right. It would cost about two dollars per year per household mm -hmm. for about four years. So as one 
uh, of the experts' comments. It's, a, it's the cost of a movie ticket. No, even, even less. I don't know where you're going to the movies. Anyway, thank you very much, <laughs> well, uh, Representative man. Boland. Thank you. With me is uh, now Maryland Congressman Andy Harris, who is on the House Appropriations Committee and a member of the Electromagnetic Pulse Caucus. All right, Congressman, since the San Jose power plant attack came to light, uh, or at least more publicly 10 months later, some of your colleagues, Senators Reed, Feinstein, and others are now pushing for stronger security standards at power plants, saying the attack was a wake-up call, as if they didn't already know, based upon legislation that you've been involved in, the work that you've done, the GRID Act, the SIPA Act, the SHIELD Act, is if this is the first time they're hearing about it. Can you please explain to the American people why these politicians decide to come out when we hear about it and be against it, but won't pass this stuff in Washington? Well, Judge, I don't know. We really have to get on this and get on it as soon as possible. Uh, we have a, the SHIELD Act before the House now. It's already been filed. We can easily amend that act to include uh, terrorist attacks or physical attacks like this attack and, uh, and protect our grid. All right. And when you talk about the SHIELD Act, I mean, you're talking about uh, it's H.R. Bill 2417? Yeah, it's, it's the act that would, that would protect against... The Magnetic pulse, but what, what the attack in California showed us is that there are other there are other hazards as well, especially a physical attack, which could be a terrorist style attack, which it appears to be that's what uh, happened in California. Well, and 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 comically, not even ironically, comically, the FBI and the local police are calling it vandalism, as if a bunch of kids decided to have a few beers, get a few AK-47s, and start sharpshooting after cutting some underground cables after and getting into a uh, a, a structure to to do that, a protect structure and avoiding the cameras and avoiding the uh, the monitors but let's get to the core issue is this about money or is it about who would take credit to protect the American people I think it's about the money. I think it's everyone expecting someone else to pay for it. This is a national issue, and uh, you know it, it can be it can be tried to be dealt with at the state level. But honestly, and unless you protect the national grid, you're not going to really make headway. So we ought to do it on a national level. And what we ought to do is we ought to take money that's already coming into the Department of Energy. They have a 30 billion dollar a year budget. 10 percent of that budget would permanently protect our grid. We ought to just do it and take the money we're already collecting. And when you talk about energy, Energy. I mean, we, we could, I could just reference a half a billion dollars that was literally thrown away on the green energy and the mess that Solyndra created for the American people. And, and finally, let me just uh, uh, ask, ask one more question. If Americans want to get their Congress people to support legislation, what do they need to do? Uh, they need to call, the, call their congressman, call their senator today, tomorrow, right now, and say, look, we need protection. Our electrical grid needs protection. Please pass the SHIELD Act and include measures in it that would protect against California-style attacks. It's simple to be done. We should do it quickly and just move on. Take care of it and move on. Congressman, the GRID Act passed the uh, House and then went to the Senate. What happened to it in the Senate? They couldn't agree on the, on the cybersecurity part of the bill. That bill addressed both EMP, physical attack, and cybersecurity. So it died. And got hung up Forget because they the couldn't reasons. agree it on it. It died, right? It, it right. died, Let and, me ask and you we're a left question. without protection. Congressman, do you find it frustrating that after the San Jose attack comes to light, we've got all of these senators, and remember, the Democrats, you know, are in charge in the Senate. They're now concerned about the dangers of having to do with the grid when they wouldn't let this thing out of committee in the Senate. They wouldn't vote it out, and they wouldn't work with the other side of the aisle to get a bill that people could agree on. It's very frustrating because we have the answers. This is not complicated, Judge. We know exactly how to protect these substations. We just got to do it. We just have to make up our mind and do it. All right, Representative Andy Harris, thanks so much for being with us. And coming up, the exclusive justice investigation into the danger facing our power grid continues. Welcome back to Justice's continuing investigation into the dangers facing the U.S. power grid. Now, you might be thinking, this could never happen. It sounds like science fiction. Let me assure you, it's real.
With me now, a man fighting to convince the nation and our leaders of this danger, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Nuclear Forces in the Reagan administration, and now President of the Center for Security Policy, Frank Gaffney. Frank, first of all, thanks for being with us. I want you first to look at an animation, and maybe you can explain to our viewers how power gets from the beginning to their homes. Sure. Here we go. There you see the generating site. That's a classic, uh, probably gas powered, I would guess. Stepping down to get the bulk power distributed as efficiently as possible through to the places that need it, namely the industrial sites, and then stepping down, stepping down to getting it to people's homes through underground power lines in some cases and above ground power lines elsewhere. And you see here a pole transformer, which most people are probably familiar with. Those are basically a dime a dozen. The ones that are very, very hard to come by and that are essentially effectively irreplaceable are the high voltage transformers that you saw in that step down that's really critical to the backbone of the grid. A couple of questions. Uh, number one, when you talk about some of the bigger parts of it, uh, is it true that some of it is made in uh, uh, China and other countries so that were they to be damaged and our power went out totally in this country, that we'd have a hard time replacing some of the main components? Yeah, as I understand it, these transformers, which as I say are the backbone really of the grid, the high energy transformers, of which we've got about 2,000 essentially no spares to speak of. They're custom built for where they go into the grid and it takes about a year to have them custom built, hand built more or less in places principally as I understand it like Germany, South Korea and India perhaps. Where the thing really breaks down is if it takes a year to get one and then once you've got it on order and delivered to a seaport you gotta really work to get it to the site. If you need 10, if you need 20, if you need 1,000 of them, forget it. forget it. All right. You have been on this for a long time, and you talk about the, the, the catastrophic consequences to human life in this country. If there were to be an attack on the grid, whether it's solar, which is natural, the electromagnetic pulse, uh, and I'm not going to go through all of the, uh, of the causes, what do you, I mean, what, what are the uh, 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 predictions? I think the most authoritative assessment of all of this has been done, and I know you've got a copy of a book that we've just put out entitled Guilty Knowledge, which describes 11 studies. It's the executive summary of 11 studies that the government has done over the past decade. The first of them, and arguably one of the most important, was d done by a Blue Ribbon Commission created by the Congress, led by a fellow by the name of Dr. William Graham. Dr. Graham believes, on the basis of this detailed study over several years, that after a year without power in large parts of the United States, nine out of 10 Americans will be dead. Dead. This is dead. a catastrophe, obviously, of the first order. The economy is created, society is broken down. And the trouble is, if you try to fix it at that point, it's too late. Right. You right. need to fix it now to prevent such an eventuality. Now, let's talk about, I, I want you, I think we have something that, that we can throw up now on some of the SAM missiles that just recently uh, came to light. Tell us about what was found <laughs> this is a, inside of a ship, a North Korean vessel that was intercepted and searched in Panama last summer. Uh, in its hold, in those green canisters, you see surface-to-air missiles, old ones, mm -hmm. but surface-to-air missiles known as SA-2s. Uh, they are very reliable. They are designed to be either conventionally armed or nuclear armed. Had they had a nuclear weapon on them, and some of them were actually on their launchers, and those things were on the top of the ship instead of down under 10,000 tons of sugar, mm -hmm. they could have launched with essentially no warning an EMP, electromagnetic pulse attack, and detonated a nuclear weapon high right. over the United States with, again, devastating effects. Uh, but let's talk about the fact that in the southern part of our country, the approaches are not as uh, protected as other parts? Well, they're not protected at all. In fact, we don't even have warning systems that something like those SAM missiles might be sending a missile our way, let alone any means of destroying that missile in flight. This is one of the things that I think pose, those of us who believe that missile defense is a necessary component of a strong national security have argued for. But quite apart from that, we need to have these P-51 
pieces of the grid, most especially these irreplaceable transformers, hardened, protected. And the good news about this, of all of the problems that you cover on your show and I worry about day in and day out, Judge, this is one we know what to do about. For over 50 years, the Pentagon, in which I served, has been hardening things that are top priorities. But then what's the we problem with NERC and FERC and getting legislation out of Washington? The American people should be outraged, as I am. They should. This is an absolute scandal. And that's what this book is about, is demonstrating the guilty knowledge of our government. Of our government. And, and, and we've got Fred Upton. We've been asking him for about seven weeks whether or not, uh, uh, he, number one, he'd come on the show. We'd take so much money from lobbyists, energy companies. And now... Now he's in charge of the Energy Committee. We need bills to get out of that committee. He could make a world, a world of difference by simply enabling a piece of legislation called the SHIELD Act to get through his committee to get to the floor. Interestingly enough, he was a co-sponsor of this right. legislation at one point. Right, he was a co-sponsor of the legislation and until I've never had a satisfactory explanation for why he's allowed it to be bottled up ever since. Shame on him. There's efforts now underway in the Senate to begin getting that kind of legislation through over there. We can get this done, but you've been rendering an incalculably important service to the country oh. by letting the American people know, and if they'll just do their part, we can harden the grid and protect ourselves from this calamity. Thank you, Frank. Gaffney. And coming up, an urban survivalist shows me how to survive if the grid does go down. We're back with our special justice investigation into the safety of the United States power grid. And joining me now is Eitan Edwards, who is the uh, executive director for International Preparedness Network That's and the uh, Urban Survivalist. So what do, you, what do you do? I mean, how do you prepare for something like Sandy or the power outage in 2003? But if there were to be something that would be nationwide, I mean, do we survive? How does the individual survive? Well, the individual has to do the things beforehand. They have to take the necessary steps to protect themselves. Because obviously, as you discussed in earlier part, of the program that you know government isn't going to do the job it's not it's not functional in this way there's so much debate about what needs to get done and what we should do what the people have to recognize is they have to do for self at this point and the only way to protect yourself from a catastrophe of this magnitude is to take the precautionary measures that you need to do before it happens so All that right, you know so, when it does so, so what do I do I mean you know look we live in a society where everything is fast food immediate gratification you know you pull into a uh, drive-through and you get lunch and you're happy right I right mean, how do I survive if if I have no food. Well, okay. Well, you do it like you have like a threat assessment, which is to say, well, what's the problem? And uh, then you develop what the solutions are to the problem, okay? So we have a blackout, a large scale power outage, which would, of course, if it were reduced by M, it would be a long term catastrophe instead of a short term. So we, then how do I survive? So you've got to take, well, what do you need? You need food, you need water. You can get them in camping goods stores, you can get them online. There are all kinds of uh, specifically freeze-dried food because dehydrated food just comes dehydrated food. Freeze-dried is already prepared, so all you really need is some water and a source of heat to heat it up. Now, if you don't want to do that, then you have canned goods because the canned goods are non-perishable food items that you don't need to put in a refrigerator. What is it going to take for Americans to realize, just the way in Lower Manhattan they realize on 9-11 that it can change in a minute? Yeah, I, I, I think that sometimes people can be overwhelmed by the information itself because is so much like you mentioned earlier in the program about the Carrington event in 1859. Right. And if we had a Carrington event similar to that, people do not understand the magnitude of an emergency like that if it happened today. And they've got to recognize that if people thought Katrina was bad, we're talking about transformers being destroyed. The, the power transformers themselves, they can't be repaired. They have right. to be replaced. Eitan, what would you say to people who think that preppers or what we're talking about is like a fringe movement. Well, I mean, you know, obviously that there are different degrees of prepping in that respect, but I can tell you this much, in times of trouble and in times of chaos, it's the preppers who are going to have food. It's the preppers who are going to have water. It's the preppers who are going to have first aid. It's the preppers who are going to have all of their medications. So, it depends on what you want to look at it, but you know what they say, it's better to, uh, you know, to have and not need than to need and not have. All right, uh, Eitan Edwards, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having we me. We appreciate it. What you've just seen and heard is the very, very possible future if we do not do something to protect our grid. What's even more frightening 
is that this can be prevented. But as with most problems, greed, self-interest, and politicians who care more about their next election than the American people and a lack of leadership in our capital interfere with our safety. The shame is that the principal federal regulator that establishes standards for local power companies is also tasked with promoting the interest of the utilities. Now, how do you regulate and promote private companies at the same time? The legislation intended to protect us has been blocked in Washington again and again. There is one bill that can help us prevent this catastrophe and remedy our vulnerability. And make no mistake, it can be remedied. Politicians are blocking that bill. They're playing politics with our lives, and we cannot tolerate this. This is a nonpartisan issue, one of the most important in Washington today, and it's not going away. I'm not afraid to say that this scares the hell out of me, and it should scare the hell out of you, too.